Father, we thank you for your great mercies towards us. We thank you that we're here together on the Sabbath day and we pray now as we open your word that you will instruct us. We need more than information. We need an experience. We need to know that we have a connection and that we're living in your kingdom of grace. We thank you for your goodness to us and we pray now as we open your word that you will speak to us and we will understand. We thank you once more that you take us where we are and you keep lifting us to higher ground. We thank you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay. I have a couple of questions here right away and I'm glad to see that at the beginning. Before we get into Revelation 18, <coughs> maybe we'll take a quick peek here. <coughs> I'm not picking up the vibration so well just now. I think some cold got in my throat. I have to concentrate on, on talking now. <laughs> hmm. I have heard that we should not reprove sins and others to love everyone into repentance. In the story of Achan, things are somewhat different. Uh, something about reproof and disfellowship. Okay, concerning reproof and disfellowship. Okay, if I'm understanding the question here, first of all, God is in the business of reproving sins. Okay? That's important in the Scriptures. People would not become converted. They would not be motivated to move forward if these things weren't true. So God is certainly interested in that side of things. The question is, how does God choose to do it? And what is its real function? Why should God reprove sins? I think part of the key was in the, the very question, repentance is the whole issue. Repentance is always a gift from God. We never make repentance ourselves. We, can't, we don't have any equipment to come up with repentance. God does that Himself. He gives it to us as a gift. And he has lots of ways of doing that. But that repentance comes when that person is headed towards Christ. It never comes without Christ. It's impossible. So the person has to already have the Spirit working in them to be drawn to Christ so that they can be given repentance. It would be useless for a person to get repentance if they weren't coming towards Christ. <laughs> okay? So... That's the first important thing we want to know. Repentance is not something we do. Repentance is what God gives us as a gift. Now, what about the reproving of sins? I'm taking for granted here that we're talking about something happening in the church. That we're not talking about seeing someone on the street doing something, but something going on in the church. That turns out to be a different setting. Uh, for this reason, in the church... We have several kinds of people. Okay. And there's one side of this we have not talked about yet. <clears throat> Justification is available to all human beings. Jesus covers the whole world with what he did. Justification is there to be received through the conditions and the steps that Jesus says. And that's a free gift too. But here's the problem. Justification is not sanctification. Justification is our title to heaven. And God gives that to us through the merits of Jesus alone, where there's nothing we can do about that except receive it through faith in Christ. But sanctification is different. It also is a gift from God but there's something we must do. And here's the problem. Sanctification is another word for perfection. And I'm not sure that we in the church have understood that that's what it is. Some people think you get perfection as a gift too. Well, everything comes from God, 
but he can't make you perfect without your cooperation. And so sanctification is that process by which we are perfected. And notice, it is a process. It's not something that happens in a flash. You are born again in a flash. But you are not perfected in a flash. Did you notice that when you became a Christian, you still had problems? <laughs> That's because you were justified and you were put on the road to sanctification, of perfection. Now, in Christ, you're perfect as far as the Father is concerned. You could die any time and be okay to take to heaven. Because you have faith in the merits of Jesus. But you are not who you are slated to be yet. Your character must develop through trial. Through process. Through, uh, unfortunately for us, ups and downs. The ups and downs, we decide. God can make this process short. Or it can be long because that's what we do to ourselves. <laughs> okay? But it doesn't have to be long. Now here's the issue, and this is the problem in our midst today. I don't think we're understanding this. The issue in Christianity is to take sin out of us. And to do it so perfectly that the only thing in that person is love. The love of God. And that love will keep a person from sinning. But most of us don't believe in it. <laughs> we don't believe that that's what God does to a Christian, is actually take sin out of them so they don't sin. Now, when I say they don't sin, I'm talking about choosing rebellion against God. That's sin. That's transgression of the law. I'm not talking about things we do because we don't know enough. We make mistakes. Okay? And God does not count those as sin. It is sin on an absolute scale, but He's not counting it. It doesn't break anything. That's covered in Christianity. So when we go along, you know, your body can make you make a mistake. Your body can get you out of sorts so that you're, you're confused and you're not listening as carefully. And somebody says something, you might relate incorrectly because you're not getting it all. And you might say something inadvertently that you don't mean to say it that way, but your body's tearing you up. Your mind isn't thinking correctly and that's charged as a mistake. And you realize, you know, I shouldn't let myself get like that. But you are in a love relationship with God and you are in the place of fulfilling the law through love even in a mistake. Now, if you don't understand that correctly, the new theology is waiting for you. The new theology says that everything you do that's wrong is a sin. Well, you know, you can go nuts thinking of your life as everything you do is a sin. <laughs> no, everything is sin in an absolute level, yes, but God doesn't deal with us as absolutes. We're not absolute. We are creatures. And we live on very relative scales of things. Now, everyone in this room lives on a different scale because you all have a different education. You all have a different background on how you understood Christianity. You all have a different way of approaching how you see things. Everybody's different in this room. And God has to look at each one of us based on who we are, not on who we think we should be but for somebody else. Okay? God sees each one of us and He knows what's inside. And He knows all the factors. And He says, if you are in Jesus Christ, you are fulfilling the law through love. You love Jesus. Now, I've gone through this because if we don't understand these things about 
everybody's different than how God is doing things, we're going to start making a standard for other people. Now, there's two kinds of glass. One is a mirror, and one is a window. <laughs> if you spend all your life looking out the window to see how people are doing, you're going to find it very easy to see all the things they're doing wrong. It's very easy. <laughs> but if you step over just a little bit and you look in the mirror, <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> you're going to see something that's worse than what you're seeing out there. I said worse. Because you know more about your insides than you do about theirs. <laughs> it's going to be worse. Some of the best evangelists that have ever been on this planet have made a little story about that and they say, oh, here's this famous preacher, here's this famous preacher, here's this famous preacher, and then they go over the mirror and they say, and there's the devil. They weren't the devil, but they could see the devil working on them. See? And that's what we need to know. The devil's working on us all the time. Now, when you look out the window, you can see all these things. But you aren't accountable for any of it. Not a shred. <laughs> but when you step over to the mirror, <laughs> you're going to have to pay now. <laughs> you're accountable for everything you see in that mirror. And God's going to make you stay accountable. Now, because we have all kinds of different people in the church, we have some people who are in the church and they are justified. They are Christians. But they don't know anything about the perfection God requires of them. They're real Christians. But they don't know this yet. God has them on a program that He's going to get it to them in the right time, in the right place. But they don't know it. It doesn't mean they're not Christians. It's just they don't know it. And then there are other people in the church who've been there for years and years and years and somewhere along the line God brought it to them that He has them on a program of being perfected and they see it and they understand it and they aim for it all the time. And then there are other people who have crossed the line who have actually given up sin because they believe what God says. They're a rare breed but they're in the church too. So we've got different ones at different levels inside the church. And for us to try to make everybody the same is just something that not even God does. He just doesn't do it. He can't do it. It's not possible to make us all the same without making us into robots. <laughs> so we have to give each other some room. That's why. The highest thing in the church is not law-keeping. The highest thing in the church is to love each other. And you know who God said to love? He said it point blank. He said, if you just love people that you find it easy to love, who are you different than <laughs> the heathen out there? They do that. <laughs> they get along fine with everybody that gets along with them. And they love everybody that loves them. So Jesus told us what a Christian does. Love your enemies. Oh. <laughs> That's a command. That is not an option. That is not an alternative. That's what a Christian is. Love your enemies. Well, now you have a way of throwing a flag in front of you. Am I one of the perfect ones yet? <laughs> yeah, that's a good indicator. God has given us lots of indicators to those who are in the process of understanding what perfection is and what He's going to do for them. The perfect ones, the ones who have crossed that line, love, and when an enemy comes in front of them, it doesn't change. They're still loving them. And so Jesus took it a step further. He said, love those who persecute you. 
Now, Christianity is not about going to church on the Sabbath day. <laughs> love is what it's all about. Real, practical, every day, everywhere. Love. And God says, love is the fulfilling of the law because you can only live that way if you have Christ living inside of you. That's what Jesus brings. And so perfection is just another word for sanctification, the real thing. Now, when you read the scriptures, and we may do this sometime in the near future, the scriptures say that when a person has suffered, when they've been through the process, they cease from sin. It doesn't say they will when Jesus comes back. It says they do that while they're living on this earth. Cease from sin. And it is that perfection that God is trying to bring Seventh-day Adventists into so that we will no longer want to sin. It won't be there anymore. All right. So we have all these different degrees of people in the church. What should we do about it? In the Christ Object Lessons, page 70, The field, Christ said, is the world, but we must understand this is signifying the church of Christ in the world. So the world in the parable is the church. It says the parable is a description of that which pertains to the kingdom of God, his work of salvation of men, and this work is accomplished through the church. Now please don't throw that sentence away. There are lots of people who think they can do this by themselves. They're going to do it now. No, it says through the church church. No independent atoms through the church. It says, true, the Holy Spirit has gone out into all the world. Everywhere it is moving upon the hearts of men. But it is in the church that we are to grow and ripen for the garner of God. Grow in the church. You see, if we were already perfect, where's the growing? We are seeking this perfection all the time. But one of the things about the perfection is giving up sin. Okay? We don't move on to perfection if we're going to hold on to sin. We can be justified as sinners. That's the way sinners get to be justified. They're sinners. <laughs> but sanctification is not holding on to sin. And some of us are clearer on it than others in our understanding. But all of us have to get there before Jesus comes back. He plans to perfect the church. He says he's coming back to our church without spot, without wrinkle, without any problems. All right, so the, in this church then, it says that he sowed good seed. Well, we know that the church doesn't always have good seed. Satan is a deceiver. When he sinned in heaven, even the loyal angels did not fully discern his character. This is why God did it and not at once destroy Satan. Had he done so, the holy angels would not have perceived the justice and love of God. So notice, between God and Satan, God did not deal with him openly right away. There's a principle there of how God deals with things. He did not do something about it right away so everybody could get confused. It says, A doubt of God's goodness would have been an evil seed that would yield the bitter fruit of sin and woe. Now remember, the way God does it is always right. This is what God did with Satan. Don't start something that will turn into a bitter seed. Therefore, the author of evil was spared fully to develop his character. Through long ages, God has borne the anguish of beholding the work of evil. Uh, he has given the infinite gift of Calvary rather than leave any to be deceived by the misrepresentations of the wicked one. For the tares could not be plucked up without danger of uprooting the precious grain. Who's the tares here? <laughs> Satan and his angels. They could not be uprooted right away. But a time came when something had to be done. 
And who did it? It was Jesus. He did it. How did he do it? Did he go out there by himself to do something? He did it through the church. Through the angels that were loyal. And that's the way he still does it today. Is through the church. God deals with sin and reproving through the church. Now it has to be that way because maybe one person might be wrong. But the church, which can also be wrong, has the authority to deal as a system, as an organization. And if they're wrong, there's a price to be paid. But it was done under the name of God through His system, through His organization. So, the terrors and the wheat, we know the principle. What did God say about how to deal with the terrors? Did He say to rip them up? <laughs> he didn't do that. <laughs> what did He say to do? Just, just leave them alone for now. So there's going to be a harvest. Now, obviously He doesn't leave the terrors just to be terrors. He's interested in them. So what does He do? He puts Christians in front of them to be Christians so the terrorists can tell the difference. And this is the only way anybody has ever won to Jesus Christ is to see a Christian not to be reproved. Let me read you that one. I'll find it for you here a second, a page. Um, Mount of Blessings. I think I will. I don't know if I have all... I only brought one book in here with me today. Yeah, Mount of Blessings. Here it is. Page one, 128, I believe. Let me see. Okay, it starts on 128 and goes over to 129. It says, Not until you feel that you could sacrifice your own self-dignity and even lay down your life in order to save an erring brother have you cast the beam out of your own eyes so that you could be prepared to help your brother. Now that's a principle that will not go away. When we're willing to die for that person, not for a doctrine, but for the person, there's a difference. <laughs> that being, it says, then you can approach him and touch his heart. <laughs> Where does conversion happen? Yeah, that's the only place it happens, is in the heart. The head doesn't count. It won't do it. We've got lots of people in the Adventist church who got there because of their head. Somebody missed the heart. And that's all that counts with God, is the heart. And so when we, as Christians, approach a person, that's where we're supposed to be aiming, is for their heart. All right, then it says, here's the sentence, no one has ever been reclaimed from a wrong position by censure and reproach. Now, if you ever need to memorize a sentence on this subject, there's the sentence. No one has ever been won by censure or reproach. It has never happened in all history. But what's the rest of the sentence here? But many have thus been driven from Christ and led to seal their hearts against conviction. They're what? The only place that counts. They sealed their hearts. The interesting thing is that when we're trying to help a person, <laughs> we need to back up a little bit and notice something about that person really. They already know they're in trouble. They know they're sinners. And most of the time when a person gets that way in the church, they start blustering. They start doing a lot of interesting things. They turn into jokers. Yeah. That's where the jokers come from in our midst. The people who know they're not spiritual. 
They're trying to cover it up by being everybody's buddy. That's one of the one of the signs. There are lots of other signs. I won't give you all of them. You might recognize too many of them. <laughs> but the hard thing about being a sinner is people usually know it. And we don't help them by telling them we know it too. <laughs> We've got to first let them know that we're sinners. Is there anything we can do? Do they want to talk about anything? Never accuse. You know who does that? It's his name, isn't it? The accuser of the brethren. Accusation does not come from God. It comes from another cover-up. So I've gone into this because this is an excellent question. I'm sure lots of us can look around and say, Oh, brother, so-and-so is doing something, or sister so-and-so. Who's going to tell them? <laughs> <Who's gonna laughs> well, we need to pray about this. And if God tells us to be the one, then we need to figure out how would Jesus do this. I can give you some very good examples because uh, I've been there. I've talked to lots of people in my life. <laughs> and I've been doing this for a while and you're into all kinds of situations. There was a fellow who was an elder of a church. And he had smoked in times past, but he was an elder now and he gave up all that. He was a, he was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was baptized. He said he was a Christian. Everybody took him in his word. He was an elder. Moving along. And one day, he was in an alley someplace where I suppose he didn't think anybody was watching him. And he looked around, he pulled a package of cigarettes out of his pocket. And he ducked behind the building there, and a church member went by just as he did that. <laughs> yeah. Saw the cigarette come out. And of course, the church member came to me instead of going to the person. Mistake number one. <laughs> okay. And the church member told me, you know, I saw elder so-and-so back there. He pulled his package of cigarettes out. <laughs> and so I said, well, okay. I said, you, you've unburdened yourself. Uh, I asked him. I said, have you talked to him about it? I said, no. I said, well, we'll talk about this later then. Uh, I said, thank you. Well, I don't know what they expected me to do, but we went along with our business as usual. Number one rule, let things cool off a little bit. Okay. That's what God does. When something's hot, you're not going to get through. <laughs> let things cool off just a little bit. You can see this in Alan White. If you read the testimonies and the dates, you will find that in the hard ones, she did not write to people the next week. If she did, she put it aside. There was one she let sit in her drawer for a year before she gave it to the person. Yeah. She let it cool off. Let them get to the place where they could read it and, and get something from it. Sometimes it didn't take, but at least she tried. <laughs> okay. So, gave it a little bit of time. And since this other person was getting all agitated over it, I thought, well, I better move in on this a little bit and try to cool the air here for the other person too. So I asked the elder to come see me. And the elder came in. And, and I just asked him how things were going. How was his life and all that. And he says, well, he says he's praying. He's depending on the Lord and so forth. And he made the right sounds. And I told him, you know, I have a problem here. A church member has come to me and told me they saw something. And I need you to tell me what's going on so I can get back to them and clear this thing up. And he said, well, what was it? And I told him, look, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just telling you what they told me. You tell me what's going on. And he said, well, I told him they saw you at such and such a place. And they saw you pull out a package of cigarettes. And you went back and so forth. He got all red and embarrassed. <laughs> and he, he said, well, he said, I didn't want anybody to know, but my son has taken up smoking cigarettes and I took these away from him. 
And I was throwing them away that day when I was back there. I didn't want anybody to know. I don't know what to do with my son because he's hooked on these things. <laughs> and so you see right away it had nothing to do with the elder, but if that church member had turned loose and started on the telephone, that could have ruined that man. Simply because they didn't go to him and tell him, you know, this is what I saw. Is something happening? <laughs> don't accuse. You don't know. <laughs> Even when it looks like it, right in front of you. Don't accuse. Ask questions. And sometimes you get truthful answers and sometimes you don't. But at least you get answers. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> and you have something to work with. Okay. So, this, this principle here. A tender spirit, a gentle winning deportment may save the erring and hide a multitude of sins. And do what? Yeah, God is not interested in anybody knowing. Hide it. If it's just between you and that person and you can help them, which is I think what this question is all about. If you can help a person, do it in such a way that nobody else knows. You know, we see Jesus doing that with Simon. Simon had been responsible for putting Mary in the position she was in. Yeah, he was the one. He started her off. And of course, when she was touching Jesus' feet, Simon knew who she was because he's the one who did it. And he says he's not a prophet. He would know. He would know he was touching him if he was a prophet. And so here he was talking about Jesus and talking about Mary and forgot all about who he was. <laughs> but Jesus didn't forget. He knew. <laughs> what did he do? Did he say, hey, Simon, you're pretty rotten. <laughs> you're the one that did it. <laughs> he didn't do that to Simon. He asked Simon a question. Who do you think would have more gratitude for being forgiven? The one that was forgiven this much or for the one that's forgiven this much? And Simon gave the right answer. He, he could answer good questions. <laughs> By the time it was over, he knew that Jesus knew. <laughs> no doubt, Jesus knew. And Jesus did not expose him. Didn't say a word. He just let him know. You can recover. You can recover. And Simon could not believe that he had been treated that way when he had it in his mind to do it to Mary like that. And it won his heart. It's exactly what happened. It got right inside his heart. He said, he can treat me like that. That's what I want to learn. So this is a real challenge, this question. This is real life here, and it's a real practical way of trying to understand who God is and how He does things and how we can learn that because it doesn't come natural. <laughs> Galatians, the sixth chapter. And I really appreciate this question because it gives us a chance to deal with some real life things here. And we'll get back to the second part of it about Achan because that's another important feature. In Galatians 6, Paul says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, in other words, if it's a fact, no question about it, this is a sin. And anybody would know it's a sin. The whole church would know a sin. Nobody would have any problem with this. No interpretation. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, you, which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. What's the temptation here? You see, the sin of restoring another person is one of pride. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's the proud person who will say, I'm more spiritual than you. I'm, I have to help you. That's the temptation here. When a person helps another person in humility saying, I'm the same as you. I'm a sinner too. Then everything's okay. But when a person says, hey, I'm in really proper st spiritual standing here and you're not. Then the problem could be coming up. And Paul saw it. It's a very difficult thing. He says, watch out lest you be tempted in the process here. And then he says, bear one another's burdens. In other words, get in there with the person. Hold it up with them. Be one with them. Not a judge, but a person who's going to lift it with them. Bear the burden with them. And so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? It's love. <laughs> love is the fulfilling of the law. You get in there with the person and you help them. You put your arm around them. You say, hey, I'm with you. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's pray. Whatever it takes. You've become part of it with them. You are fulfilling the law of love. It says, but if any man think himself to be something, <laughs> he's going to know there would be a big shot when he's nothing. <laughs> so he just saves himself. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing himself alone and not another. Every man shall bear his own burden. And then he goes on. Verse 7. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now, we may miss the meaning of that. But in Romans, Paul says a plainer. With the judgment that you meet out, you will be judged. In other words, the standard I'm holding you to is the one God is going to hold me to in exactly the same way. The way I judge you is the way it's going to happen when my name comes up. God's going to say, I'm going to judge you under the same standards that you used on other people. And you know what? I try not to do that. It's, it's there. We have to fight it. But I try not to do it because I surely don't want to be judged based on my understandings. I don't want to ever see that. <laughs> I want God to step in with everything He knows and judge me His way. And I have to leave it there. It's the safest place to be. So remember Galatians 6, Christ Object Lessons 71 and 72. And that will help. Mount of Blessings, page 128 for your notes. A powerful pages, 128 and 129. Now, the second part of this question, I won't spend as much time, but it talks about Achan here. Now, something happened in the camp with, with Israel. And I think this is another uh, part of the question here that we need to understand in terms of church. The Israelites had been around Jericho, and they thought they got a victory, didn't they? But who got the victory? <laughs> they didn't do anything but walk around the place. <laughs> they didn't pick up a rock. They didn't throw a spear. They didn't say boo. They just hollered when God said to... <laughs> it was God's victory. They had nothing to do with it. <laughs> That's what he means by justification. You have nothing to do with it. <laughs> what are you getting all puffed up about? <laughs> so, but they did. They got all puffed up. <laughs> and they saw a little teeny town that they thought was in the way. It was a little one, a little bitty place. Jericho was a nice Here's this little place. And they said, well, let's go over there and wipe them out so we can go on in. I guess they figured they got enough practice with the swords of Jericho that now they could use them. And so they sent a committee over there. They didn't even need a whole army. They said, forget it. There's not enough people over there. Just send some of us over there. So they went over there. The Bible tells us the people and I, that little group in there, came out like a bunch of hornets and chased those Israelites all over the place. <laughs> and that's the setting of Achan. Okay. Joshua got down on his face on the ground. And he says, oh, the glory's gone already. <laughs> I've heard lots of ministers say that, by the way. The glory's gone just because something shifted. <laughs> Have you ever said that? Oh, God isn't with me anymore because. 
Careful. Careful. <laughs> so God told, told him to get all the people together. And God said, we have a problem here. First of all, I didn't send you over there. <laughs> I didn't ask you to do that. <laughs> but the reason you got whipped so bad is you have a problem in the church. And they said, well, what's the problem? I told you not to take this stuff. And there's a man who's taken it and he took it and buried it and he's keeping it for himself. How many people? One. One person in the church who's a rebel. Are you getting the importance of this question? <laughs> One person. And of course we know the story how God whittled it down and finally there was Achan. And when, they, when they, everybody was looking at him and everybody was pointing their fingers, he confessed. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of confessions that God doesn't pay attention to once you're caught. But the problem here is that Achan was a member of the church and God said, I will not bless the church while he's in it. That's a little rough, isn't it? I wonder if God is the same today. I wonder how many Achans we have today. I don't think it's one anymore. God said, don't do this. Are there any people in the church doing it anyhow? So what are we supposed to do about the Achans in the camp? This is a very perceptive question here. <laughs> this is really a good question. I'm not going to give you an answer because... We don't have the equipment to go Aiken hunting anymore. We've lost it. God says something in His Word and somebody says, well, yeah, but... A person who says, yeah, but, is not an Aiken finder. <laughs> no equipment today. We have Aikens in some very interesting uh, places, which makes it even tougher. But you know, I read something this morning. I was reading through Wesley's works. And I read uh, some of the things he said about perfection. Beautiful things. He really had an understanding. But one of the things that people kept, kept beating him over the head with, because he preached... Moving away from sin and moving towards perfection. And dealing with sin completely and moving over into that place where God has described in the Bible what a Christian is in their perfection phase. And people were always hitting them in the head with questions. And one of the questions they asked was, well, where in the Bible can you see one? <laughs> where in the Word of God can you see one? They said, well, John? It says, as Christ is, I am. <laughs> Over the first John. And I said, well, can you show us another one? <laughs> and he says, well, what difference does it make how many I show you? You're not asking to know. <laughs> you, you don't understand this experience. How can I tell it to you? <laughs> I could show you a thousand and you wouldn't recognize them. <laughs> Which was the truth. But anyhow, he goes through this whole thing. It's beautiful how he goes through this. All these arguments that people are throwing at him. And he answers with scriptures. Just scriptures. Scriptures. He's just keeps reading Bible. <laughs> and finally he says, at the end of this, he says, well, he says, no matter how many things you can point at that don't work, those are not witnesses for God. Throw those away. All these witnesses 
False witnesses, throw them away. You keep the truth of the word. So we don't need to be looking around. <laughs> keep the word if you're the only one. So we can't go Aiken hunting anymore, I don't believe. It's too late. God's going to have to take care of the Aikens himself, his way. Ellen White warned us we'd come to this time. She says there would be those that if you do say something, real Christianity is persecuted everywhere where there's somebody else. <laughs> Always. So don't think it's some sort of a surprise if you find yourself at the end of a <laughs> bunch of people pointing their fingers at you because you're trying to do it Christ's way. It's going to happen. Okay, maybe that's enough on this question. There's a lot more here. Th these are tremendous thoughts. But let's deal with these things in the way the Bible deals with them and the way... The Spirit of Prophecy tells us it's a little more clear in the Spirit of Prophecy, but let's get over there and let's study these things. Another one. So far, you've given us two different meanings to Revelation 17 about the beast, the position of rise, and the power of women. Are there more? <laughs> well, I'm sure there are, but I don't know them all. and I'm just concerned about the features of it that deal with, with our message to the world. You see, part of our message is the second angel's message. Babylon has fallen. And it's a hard part to give because you have to label churches for what they are. They're in apostasy. And that's not the first part of what we talked about to people about. We must deal with Jesus and salvation, all of that, personal relationship. But we cannot leave out the part about the false churches because that's part of the third angel's message. And by the way, God must have thought it was really, really important because there are so many scriptures that deal with this apostasy. As a matter of fact, today, uh, Revelation 18 is where we are. And the entire 18th chapter is about how he's going to deal with Babylon in the actual judgment, the execution of the judgment. So uh, I won't get into any more identifications of, <laughs> of women there for now. We may come back to some of these things. All right, let's go back now to Revelation 18 and let's pick up some things. John begins by saying, after these things. After what things? Well, after what he saw in Revelation 17, which was a lot of stuff. <laughs> now, just very quickly, let me remind you. That we had five that were, and they were gone when he was looking. And then he saw a sixth one come up, but it really was not the same thing. It was not a nation anymore. It was a global ideology. And that global ideology took away the power of the beast to persecute, the Catholic Church to persecute through governments. And that was the ideology that has come down to us in these last 200 years. A scientific endeavor, basically. Atheistic scientific endeavor. Whether in philosophy or whatever field. And that power running through the world has taken away persecution from this planet. But the strange thing is that Ellen White called that a new manifestation of satanic power. So it was not a help. It just took away persecution. <laughs> it's still the devil working. Now he's working through two sides. And Babylon, we saw, consisted not only of the Catholic Church, but it was the daughters, and it was a global system then. And we see that even atheism is going to join that Babylonian system. That's what chapter 18 is about. So let's look now. It says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, has fallen and has become the habitation of devils 
and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Well, this is an Eastern way of doing things, laying on more and more symbols, and we see them packed on here. Foul spirit, cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's pretty bad, Sandy. But notice what it says here. This angel message with a strong voice saying, with a loud voice saying, Babylon the Great's fallen. So we have a loud cry here. And part of that loud cry is about Babylon has fallen. In early writings, page 85, it says, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel. And prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. So, Revelation 18 is not sequential. It doesn't come after Revelation 17, particularly in all the places. Some of these things fit in between. But the point here is that the loud cry will be given. And you'll notice in the Bible that it said what the loud cry is about. Babylon is fallen. So I think we need to brush up on our Babylon a little bit so we know what to tell people. Why it's fallen? What happened? That's part of our message. The latter rain, uh, sorry, Testimonies to Ministers 506. The latter rain falling near the close of the season ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. Did you see what that little sentence just said? <laughs> we are to be perfected. If we don't believe in perfection God's way, how are we going to do that? When he says we are to cease to sin, that's what he means. Now, we didn't do it the day we were baptized. But somewhere along the line, we've got to get the idea that's where he has us aimed. <laughs> that we're not done until he can get this in us. <laughs> okay. Now, because it didn't happen on the first day, a lot of people get discouraged. And they say, well, I guess it didn't work. Well, they're misunderstanding what God does. We are Christians through the merits of Jesus alone. We live every day through His power and through His merits alone. But that merit is doing something in us as we surrender to it, as we grow, as we develop. We are changing. Something is really happening. It's real. She said something else just in passing here. She said something about the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. Don't let these words go by. What does completion mean? Doesn't it mean that God finally did it? He got it done? What did He get done? What was grace for? <laughs> Saving grace in one instant took us out of our past and put us in a place where love fulfills the law. All of our works become the works of Jesus Christ in us and through us. Even our mistakes are covered. Now, as we are on that process, God has in mind of finishing it and completing it. Do you think that God's going to be holding you up for all eternity so that you don't sin anymore? Is God holding up the holy angels by grace so that they don't sin? Maybe you haven't thought about some of these things. I don't know. <laughs> Do the angels need grace? No. Why? Yeah, they don't need, they're not sinners. 
they don't need Christ. Are you going to be a sinner in eternity? Will you need grace? No. So, there is a point at which grace is necessary. And then there's a point at which grace has done its work. And then you really are a person that doesn't require grace anymore. Grace completes its work and the sanctuary shows us where. When a person goes through the sanctuary, goes through all the steps, they're going through entrances and entrances. There are five pillars here and there are four here into the, holy, the sanctuary, the holy places. Five stands for grace. A person becomes a Christian out here, but this is where they live by faith as a Christian. In here they eat the bread of life. That's where the table of showbread is. They have the lampstand, the light. They are the light of the world. And the incense in here, their prayer life, the connection with God through Christ, all of that's in the holy place. That's where a Christian lives by faith. That's their experience. So it's all through grace. Those five pillars, through grace. But when they finally get into the most holy place, it's because grace has completed its work. When the person, when their name comes up in the most holy place in the judgment, when the records are brought forth, God is not going to judge His grace. He knows how good He is at giving grace. He doesn't have to judge that. What is He going to judge in this room if He's not going to judge grace? Is he going to judge my faith? Why should he do that? He gave me the faith. <laughs> he doesn't have to judge my faith either. There's not a word in the Bible that says, on the day of judgment, God is going to judge my faith. I never found that word. Ever. We're told very precisely what he judges in that day which is called in the Bible, our works. God judges everyone by their works, not by grace, not by faith. Grace and faith will have had to accomplish their work by this time. Now, if this person in here is judged by their works, who do you suppose they are for the rest of eternity? They have been sealed and it can never be changed again. They are righteous. They really are righteous. It's not a pretend righteousness. It's not an imputed righteousness anymore only. It is a righteousness they really possess. It is a righteousness they really own. They are holy children of God now because He's brought them all the way through the redemption process. They really are holy. And through all eternity, they will remember why they are holy. It wasn't because they worked their way towards it, but because they cooperated with Jesus and He was able to perfect them and to bring them there to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. How much? All unrighteousness. He took all sin out of them through this process. But He did it while they were living. He did not do it when He came back. That's where all of us are supposed to be today in this process. So that God can point to us and it'll be a different time for each one of us and say, this one has been delivered from sin. Yeah. Delivered from sin. It's not there anymore. Love has taken its place. This is why we can't try to get good. We don't have the equipment. We have to let God move us through the process. But we have to strive 
to let him do what he can do. <laughs> we must agonize in prayer or it's not going to come. We've got to put in the effort of our mind and talent, efforts, everything and give ourselves to God and we will know we're doing this because Paul gave us the clue. He says, for me to live is Christ. He got there. <laughs> Nothing else mattered. Yes, he needed to do things to maintain himself and he worked to help other people. He, he uh, supported several ministers and he wouldn't take any money for himself. He was in a particular place. He did some very interesting things. But he got to the place where he could say and knew it was the truth. For me to live is Christ. Period. And then he said, as another way of understanding this, he said, I have learned to be content wherever I am. <laughs> I've been rich, I've been poor. I've been lifted up and I've been put down. <laughs> it says, I've learned to be content. Yeah. When you read your Bibles, Read them for the clues. That's Christians talking in there. <laughs> and they're trying to tell us what it really is. It's for us the same way it is for them. Okay. So grace then, in just this one little sentence, it flies by real fast. God has in mind that grace will complete its work in us and we will be perfected in our character. Perfected. Now... That doesn't mean we will be static. We'll still be learning things of Christ for all eternity. But our character has been formed. It is a holy character then. In Great Controversy, page 611, the angel who unites the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. Worldwide. Why does it have to be worldwide? The apostasy is worldwide. That ideology is worldwide. The, the uh, beast powers, the things that are being described as symbols again, those are worldwide powers now. And so this message must be a worldwide message to meet the... It says the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost as the former rain was given. Pentecost is former rain. In the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspring of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. So the latter rain will be at the end of the whole process to bring the harvest. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. Other places, she says flat out, it will be accompanied by more power in places all over the world. It's an amazing thing. We can think of the wonderful power of the early reign. We can read about it as history. But God has told us He's going to do it again, only it's going to be more powerful this time around. More powerful than what? Those 11 men plus Paul, once it took hold through those people and then it started going out geometrically, we're told that the gospel went to all the known parts of the world in one generation. We have more than 12 people. How long is it going to take us to get this done when we decide to do it? <laughs> it's not going to take any time at all. We just haven't decided to do it. We wait for people to come into our tents when we put them up. <laughs> you know, I really haven't seen one of those in the Bible yet. I think it's a good idea to put up a tent every now and then, but that shouldn't be the only thing we do. We all have neighbors. We should every day be thinking, 
of some influence to put in the neighborhood, even if it's just to think about it. Do you know that those people will catch it? You get out in your yard and you start doing something, you hang around long enough, you're going to catch somebody's eye. And give them your Christian eye. <laughs> yeah. Something will happen. Just a little conversation, but it'll be enough. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven by thousands of voices all over the earth the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. You see, we aren't doing those things right now because Satan can counterfeit doing it one at a time. But when thousands are out there doing this, God's going to turn it loose again. I was just asked the question last Sabbath here. No, Wednesday was, Wednesday night, about miracles. Something came up about the dead. And the question was asked, well, does that happen any place? Does God raise the dead anywhere? And I had to tell him, yes, he's doing it today. <laughs> he's still doing it. <laughs> I could tell him stories, but I told him the one closest to me. My daughter was raised from the dead. She was dead for 20 minutes. Michelle. <laughs> when we were at the seminary, she died. She's alive and well today. <laughs> okay. God's still doing it. If He can raise the dead, He can do all the rest of it too. Satan also will work with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. I'm not too sure what that means. I can only speculate. Fire. I think this is real fire. People have tried to make all kinds of spiritual things out of it. I think it's fire. He's going to do something scientific that will really get everybody's attention. Some people in the 40s thought it was the atomic bomb. Maybe it was. I think it might have been a precursor. But I think science is in the middle of this one. The message will be carried not so much by argument. Get this. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by deep conviction of the Spirit of God. This really is God's gospel after all. He's going to do it. <laughs> it's going to be a power all over this world. And then some of us can forget about this harassing that we get from these Sunday keeping churches. And stop being so inferior about things. There's nothing inferior about God's message. This is the truth. This is the real thing. You know, when God keeps the Sabbath, and He does... <laughs> Desire of Ages says he keeps the Sabbath. It's his Sabbath, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's his, that belongs to us. It's, it's his Sabbath. Who do you suppose keeps it with him? Well, all the angels. <laughs> How many angels are there? Who knows? <laughs> but all the unfallen angels keep the Sabbath with God the same time that he does. And all the unfallen worlds, how many worlds are out there? Who knows? Science is just beginning to get the idea that there's no end to it out there. Billions and billions of galaxies and they just done... <laughs> they just doubled the number of the estimate last year. They doubled it. Well, they're still too small. <laughs> I mean, it's just, all those walls, all those angels, everybody's keeping the Sabbath with God when He keeps it. Well, when does He keep it? Well, even some of our theologians don't know that one yet, but it's in the Bible and it's in the Spirit of Prophecy. There is only one Sabbath in all creation. There's not two of them. There's not one for each world. That is speculation. The Bible tells us there was no Sabbath until God finished the creation. 
When did he finish the creation? It says there in Genesis 1, and the hosts of the heavens were finished. It says it in Genesis 1. His whole creation was finished. He finished it with planet earth. And man, he was done no more. And then God made the Sabbath to show I'm never going to create again. Man was where I was headed. You think about that the next time you feel down and low and say you're worth nothing. <laughs> God finished with you because you were the top. <laughs> he, he's never going to do anything else. So, God keeps the Sabbath on the Sabbath. And he told us when the Sabbath is. <laughs> it's the seventh day of earth time. Isn't it interesting? Those Renaissance people back there were right. The earth is the center of the universe. God's time. <laughs> And do you know what? He's going to put the earth at the center of the universe when it's all done. That's what that big earthquake is all about. He's going to knock it out of its orbit and it's going to go flying. And when it stops, it's going to be at headquarters. That holy city is not going to have to travel as far as we've all been telling people. <laughs> God has a plan. It's right there in the book if we'll look at it. The Sabbath is the issue because God keeps it. It's His Sabbath and all of His creation keeps it. But notice, this is where I'm headed. If God is keeping it, earth time, every seventh day, if all the angels are keeping it with Him, if all the unfallen worlds, billions and billions of worlds with all their inhabitants are keeping it, and then we here on this little speck of dust, we keep it with all of them. Who is the majority? The Sunday keepers or the Sabbath keepers? <laughs> There's no reason for a Seventh-day Adventist to hang down their head when there's a bunch of Sunday keepers saying, hey, we keep the Lord's Day and you people don't know what you're talking about. Wait a minute, we're with God! <laughs> We have a work to do for these people who don't understand the Bible so they can get in there too. You know, the Sunday keepers who have died through all the years past faithfully, they don't know it yet, but they're going to be Sabbath keepers when they get to heaven. <laughs> That's what Isaiah says, isn't it? Isaiah 66. All flesh will come to worship before me from one new moon to one, from Sabbath to Sabbath. And Jesus will have to explain to them why they're keeping Saturday instead of, instead of Sunday. <laughs> That'll be a pretty good Sabbath school lesson when he gives that one. <laughs> By the river of life, we're told, he's going to do that. He will teach the Sunday keepers why they're keeping Sabbath. That's beautiful, but we have a chance to help some people here. So this loud cry is going to go out. And people will hear it and understand because the Spirit will tell them, this is the truth. But we have to believe it. It's the only truth there is. We can't tell them this is another option. Like we're not sure. You can make your choice. It's your way to go. No, there's no choice. God's way only. Conviction. The Spirit will speak through us and tell people things they can't get away from. They're going to know that's the truth. That's power. God is there. Now, the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands that have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. 
notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. This is the truth. This is going to happen. She's told us someplace else. The judges, when they hear Seventh-day Adventists brought to court because they're breaking the law by keeping the Sabbath holy, judges will listen. And they'll take in the testimony and they'll see that conviction. And she says they will stand up and get away from the bench and come down and stand with the people. They're done being judges. Tremendous. Senators will hear this for the first time in Washington. Adventists will be dragged in front of them to talk and say why the law this and why the law that. And senators will take their position based on that also. Acts of the Apostles, page 55, the glad tidings of a risen Savior were carried to the uttermost bounds of the inhabited world. The church beheld converts flocking to her from all directions. Believers were reconverted. One interest prevailed. And that's left out of here, but that one interest was the love of Jesus being with each other. These scenes are to be repeated and with greater power. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was a former rain, but the latter rain would be more abundant. In the time of the end, when God's work on the earth is closing, the earnest efforts put forth by consecrated believers under the guidance of the Holy Spirit are to be accompanied by special tokens of divine favor. Near the close of earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit's like unto the falling of the latter rain. So all of that is in verse 2 there. The louder rain, the loud cry. Maybe we should say something about the loud cry. Um, Great Controversy 450. The warning of the third angel is represented the prophecy as being proclaimed with a loud voice. It will command the attention of the whole world. Volume 8 of the Testimonies, page 94. The message of the third angel is to prepare a people to stand in these days of peril. It is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and is to accomplish a work which few realize. Okay. okay, volume 5 of the Testimonies 383. The message loses none of its force in the angel's onward flight, for John sees it increasing in strength and power until the whole earth is lightened with its glory. Soon it will go with a loud voice and the earth will be lightened with its glory. Are we preparing for this great outpouring of the Spirit of God? So we need to prepare. I won't read it to you now, but you might for your notes, take down early writings, 71. Read that page carefully, the whole page. That page always speaks to me. Early writings, page 71. Well, let's see. We're not going to get too much further than verse 2 today. So, in the early writings 245, Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and to warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second appearing. His mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and warn man of the coming wrath of God. Multitudes received the light. Multitudes. It seems so hard today, but there's a reason why. There's several reasons. <laughs> we have not understood unity yet because of this love thing. Love brings people into unity, whether they disagree or not. They're still in unity. The thing that binds them is the life of Christ, His character. And when people are paying attention only to Jesus, they can get along with somebody who doesn't listen to them and doesn't agree with them. Because if that is a person who loves Christ, they're listening to Jesus anyhow. Okay? And that's the thing that counts here, is that we all know that we're each dealing with the same Christ. We get different things because we're tuned in differently.
But when the loud cry is given, there will be one group giving it, and the other group won't even know what's happening. All in the same place. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. There will be a third group who will see it as fanaticism. And unfortunately, the way it comes down to spirit prophecy, it's those people who are in leadership who will consider it a threat. She's labeled them. So they're used to their policies, they're used to their ways of doing things, and when something's done in a different way, they're going to say, that's dangerous. But it's the power of God working, and the people will go anyhow. They will do what they need to do under the Spirit. Now, I can say these things to you because I, I, I'm kind of like Patrix and Petrina. I've been on both sides of this thing, okay? <laughs> I've been in the organized work as a paid pastor. I've been in the organization. I've also been out working as a self-supporting ministry. I know both sides of this thing. And I don't believe any of our faithful people in leadership are going to be afraid of the real thing if they're studying and seeing it. But there are going to be some, and we know it, there are going to be some who aren't prepared for this. And we've just got to work anyhow and forget it. Just do the work. Keep moving. You see, Jesus did not ask the church for approval to do what he did. <laughs> he didn't even go to their schools. He wouldn't go to their schools. They would have contaminated him. Elijah didn't ask for permission either. And he did what God told him to do, and he didn't go to their schools either. John the Baptist didn't ask him for permission, and he didn't go to their schools either. These are three very powerful individuals we're talking about here who all did it the same way. God was their instructor. Now, in church membership, we are subject to each other. But when it comes to the conscience, we better have a direct connection. And we listen to that direct connection. And it's not going to tell you to separate from your brother, and it's not going to do that. Okay? It's going to tell you how to get along better. <laughs> You're going to have to give up certain things to keep marching together. But none of it in conscience. Your conscience will stay intact. Great Controversy 606. As the work comes for, for it, uh, to, excuse me, as the time comes for it to be given with greatest power, the Lord will work through humble instruments. You think of yourself as humble? God's holding you out. He's going to use you with great power at the end of this thing. <laughs> okay? It says, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to His service. The laborers will be qualified rather by His Spirit the unction of His Spirit, then, by the training of literary institutions. In other words, you can't go to college to learn this. This comes from God directly. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. Okay, we're in chapter 18. We're talking about how this is going to finish. No ifs, ands, or buts, no speculation here. This is the way it's going to happen. So we just need to tune in with all these thoughts and try to figure out, how do I fit in there? How do I become part of this? God's way, the way He says it. Because it's not going to happen another way. Here's somebody trying to make it another way. This was in the National Catholic Register. There was a strange sight in the Vatican last fall. American evangelical leaders joined Catholic scholars to examine the impact of globalization of the family. Among the particip uh, participants, Chuck Colson, know the name? <laughs> Chuck Colson? Dr. James Dobson? Anybody know that name? Colson commented, There was a time not long ago when evangelical Protestant leaders like myself would not have been invited to the Vatican. And if he, we had been invited, we would not have come. During the conference, Dobson 
commended the Catholic Church for having, quote, done more to protect the family and traditional morality than any other institution. This is the man that we have showing in some of our churches. I marvel every time I hear the name, his name Dawson in our midst. <laughs> this man is on the wrong side. But this kind of stuff is hitting the papers all the time. We need to wake up and see this is happening. These people are lining up with the Vatican. Exactly like is in these books. I've never seen these books say anything wrong yet. I've looked and looked and looked. And every time it comes out exactly the way we were told. I don't know how much it takes to convince us. These books are valuable. We need to know what's in them. We should be living in these books until we know what they say. I'm not going to say too much today about this, but I still have not got the courage up to talk about the, the thing. Television. I'll just give you a clue. 7T140, in a large degree, through our publishing houses, is to be accomplished the work of the other angel which comes down from heaven with great power and who lightens the earth with his glory. God has told us how he's going to finish this work. It's going to be through literature you can hand to people. And you know you can't hand them something too much further away than two or three feet. <laughs> God's going to finish this work on a personal level the same way He started it. He's not going to finish this on television. He's not going to do it. And when we start talking about this, I'm going to try to give you a demonstration, biblically and spirit prophecy, as well as some good science, why it can't be done on television. But I'll have to wait because it's going to take a couple of sessions to get through enough information to you so that you can see what the issue here really is. We're going to have to ask the question, who invented television and what does it do? Not how can you, do you think you can use it? That's a secondary question. Who invented it and what for? What does it do? We'll talk about it. Okay, we're coming... I've got to finish one section here this today. Okay, volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 19. I'm trying to stay within this context of this second verse. The message of Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. So what is it we are to do out there when we're talking to people? Our message has one basic foundation. The righteousness of Christ. Everything we talk about must have in it the righteousness of Christ. And Jeremiah tells us that's what God's people will know. Christ, my righteousness. I say it that way because in the Bible it says Christ our righteousness. And I was talking about the people. But in Ellen White's discussion of these things, I've noticed she changes the word. We are to say, Christ, my righteousness. My righteousness. I don't have to think about my righteousness. He'll work that out. He is my righteousness. That's all I need to know. If I have his righteousness, I don't have any other need. No other need. I have everything. Colossians, the first chapter, says that we are complete in Christ. Psalm 
6401, the people will draw together. You get that? The people, the th third angel's message people, they will draw together. The devil hates that. <laughs> he hates it. And I've been watching for the last dozen years to see what kind of message people really have out there when they say they've got new light. What they usually do is pull people out and separate and make people dislike organization and do all kinds of things. All the wrong fruit. All the wrong fruit. This movement began with a few teenagers, young people. <laughs> yeah. It was teenagers. Oh, I was 17. <laughs> it was a young people's movement. And it grew and developed. And it had power in it. No one could meet that power. They didn't know what it was with these, these people. They didn't know anything. Farmers. <laughs> power. The power of God in his movement. It's going to happen again. With more power. When they first started, everybody was together. Everything they did, together. It was just a small group of them. But then as it got bigger, some of the loonies came in. Yeah, anytime God does something, here they come. <laughs> From someplace, the fanatics, they start rolling around on the floors. They start doing all kinds of weird things. Some people said, oh, I'm, a, I'm the new prophet. McGuire. All kinds of strange history back then. The devil hit this church. <laughs> but the real ones kept moving through. And it stayed God's church. And it still is. And we have our share today of wild-eyed ones. But it's still God's church. He's not going to give it up. And then some goody-goodies came in and said, we're going to have the perfect church. And then they started taking people out because they couldn't be perfect in the church. They had to be perfect outside of it. Well, they showed who they really were eventually out there. And some of them are still show, showing, and some haven't shown them yet, but they're going to. In 1913, Ellen White sent a message to the General Conference. She was too sick to go anymore. But she sent a message. It's a message that's largely ignored today. She said, I have confidence in the men in the field. There were a lot of men in the field in those days, 1913. <laughs> Church had grown. And then she said, this movement, the one God started, is going all the way through. You may settle this in your minds forever. This seems to me that a person that will pull out of this church with those kinds of writings to say that they're better, I think they have a problem at least of ignorance. Because God already told us this movement's going all the way through. The way he started it. Okay. You're bound to get some letters and some tapes and something before this is all over. <laughs> Inviting you to reach a higher experience and leave the Adventist people. Just remember, God already settled that one. Yeah. Don't you fall for it because you know what he's going to do to you? He's going to put some horrible sin in front of you that somebody did in the organization. It's what he always does. Same old trick. And you're going to say, oh, look how bad they are. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> it's not how bad they are. It's what you're looking at. God's church is still there. Read the books. It's all in there. We'll be kept from so much problem if we just see what God already told us. He's warned us about everything that's coming. One T six nineteen. If God's people make no efforts on their part, but they wait, 
for the refreshing to come upon them and remove their wrongs to correct their errors, that they depend upon that to cleanse them from filthiness of the flesh and spirit and fit them to engage in the loud cry of the third angel, they will be found wanting. The refreshing or power of God comes only to those who have prepared themselves for it. So is it worth anything? We're going to have to give something for it. Our salvation is free. But that's about the only thing that's free. Everything else takes a lot of work. <laughs> we want to be part of this loud cry message. We're going to have to get in there and start digging. Early Writings 277. The message of the fall of Babylon is given by the second angel is repeated. That's the one we just read here, verse 2, with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So there are two things going on. The righteousness of Christ is being put in front of the people. And at the same time, the corruption of the churches. That they're not really teaching the righteousness of Christ at all. They're teaching a false gospel. So this is what we need to prepare for. It's not going to be easy to talk to people at both sides at the same time. We want to... Part of this question I think was alluding to it. We want to do what we think is just love. But God's love is a real love. It's a love that involves justice also, not just mercy. We've got to warn the people that God is serious, that He's particular, that He has made a solution to sin. That involves law-keeping. And if people do not want to keep the law of God, they're going to end up with a big problem. No one's going to be saved that's rebelling against God's Spirit. And God's Spirit has never taught anybody to break God's law. He has never done that. Patriarchs and Prophets 124, the existing confusion of conflicting creeds and sects is fitly represented by the term Babylon, which prophecy applies to the world-loving churches of the last days. Okay, verse 3, chapter 18, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are watched rich to the abundance of her delicacies. There are two interpretations to that verse today, and I'm not sure that both of them may not be correct. One of them is that the merchants that go out are those who go out to teach these false doctrines from all these churches, and they go all over the world. But the other uh, is that these merchants are actual merchants involved with the stock market, all this stuff, this commerce of the world, and they will back the Catholic Church first and then the Protestant churches in their move. And I think probably both of these have an aspect to this. We're just going to have to wait and see. But it says definitely that there are merchants. There's somebody going out there as front men doing the work. It talks about the abundance of her delicacies. All we'll say about this, it just says that they have learned to live luxuriously. The Catholic Church and the Protestants. So they're living high on the hog, as they say. All right, verse 4. After this, then, it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of this confusion. Come out of this false doctrine. Come out of this worldliness. Come out of the luxury. Come out of all these things. Come out of everything that really has no place in Christianity. Come out of Babylon. But notice what it says. My people. <laughs> that, to me, is a beautiful little clause there. My people. God has people in all of the churches, honest, real Christians, and they just don't know the issues yet. But I know, according to this verse, when it comes to them, they will leave that apostasy. They'll see it, and they'll go across, and they'll be satisfied to be in God's movement doing what He says for this time on earth. Uh, one time I was, uh, I remember way back at the seminary, uh, it flashes me, a young man. He really impressed me. He was such a clean-cut looking individual. 
I mean, he was, he just looked like the ideal young man. He had a good mind. He was, had a tremendous spirit. And it turned out he was a Christian. <laughs> okay. And I was working at, as an orderly, and he came there for a little while to work as an orderly too at the hospital. And we got to talking a little bit, and I realized he was a Christian, so we started talking. And as time went on, an opportunity came to talk about the law of God after we both realized that we were talking Christ and everything was okay. We understood justification and the way the gospel works. And then I asked him about the law of God and he was right there. He says, oh yeah, the law of God is important and all that. And he said all the right things. He just didn't know about the Sabbath. <laughs> and so once we talked about the law for a while and obedience and loyalty to God and all that, what redemption does, then one day we were sitting talking, I asked him if he would read the fourth commandment to me. <laughs> I said, okay. So, so he read it. And I said, uh, what do you think about that? He says, oh yeah. He says, that's binding commandment on Christians. I said, well, I believe so too. I said, what do you think that says? He said, oh, we have to uh, honor God here by keeping the Lord's day. <laughs> and I looked at him and that gave me my opening and we started talking. I asked him where it said the Lord's day and so he flipped over to Revelation, and I asked him what that meant. <laughs> and then once we went through that, I asked him, do you know of any other place? Of course, there isn't. There's no other place in the whole Bible that uses that term, Lord's Day. And he started thinking about it. And he said, well, what are you saying? I said, does, does one verse that really doesn't say that make Sunday the Lord's Day? He said, well, that's what I've taught, been taught. That's what I believe. That's what everybody I know says. <laughs> I'm going to go to a seminary. He was going to be a minister, he said that. And he said, and that's what they teach at the seminary. He said, what else could it mean? So we spent a couple of times together going through the Bible and different things. And you know, at the end of the third time, I guess it was, he looked at me. And it, just such an innocent, honest face. He looked at me and said, you know, I've never heard this before. I've never seen this before. He says, if this is the Word of God, this is what I want. <laughs> and you know, what we just read here says, there are multitudes waiting out there like that for God to give them another Word. And they will step out gladly because they know it's His voice. We don't need to be concerned about everybody in the world fighting us over this. There are people who want to know. <laughs> they will love it when it comes across. The reason, basically today, why God is not allowing it to happen like that is because we don't have unity with one another, by and large. And Ellen White tells us, we would confuse them. They know about Christian love wherever they are. That's what they hear. And the least they would expect to come into God's true church with His true message, with His true people, would be to be dropped into that atmosphere of heavenly love between the brotherhood. Yeah. Don't you think they deserve that? <laughs> sure. For some reason, we have not been able to see past our own little dogmatic ideas and we want to push for our little hobby horses and it keeps us apart like this. We can't afford it. We've got to get rid of those things that God didn't say to do. He told us to give the Sabbath, the state of the dead, the high priestly ministry of Jesus, the sanctuary. You keep your pet ideas to yourself. <laughs> keep them if they're good, but to yourself. <laughs> Let's help people meet the issue for this time. Loyalty to God through Jesus Christ by keeping His commandments. If we keep it simple, we'll find more people to talk to. We'll read some more next week. We don't have time for this week, but we're going to read some more about what Revelation 18 is trying to tell us. Traditionally, we read Revelation 18 and all we want to do is find out what Babylon's doing. But there's a lot more in, this ver in these verses. It's also saying what God is doing at the same time. So this time we just got into the louder rain and the loud cry. We'll say a little bit more about that next time and then we'll start working our way 
through the chapters to talk about the wine that's made the world drunk according to this 18th chapter. Okay, are there any last minute questions here? Okay, if you don't have any. I don't know how many of you have the uh, Bible commentaries, but if you have them, there's a little section I found in here that I haven't seen any place else. In the middle of here under Revelation 18 at the back of it, they've listed the New Testament texts and then they've put the Old Testament texts that say the same thing for the entire chapter. Well, it's more than the chapter. It's for the entire section of 17, 18, 13. Anything that has to do with Babylon, they have put the Old Testament text down. They go down with them. And you might want to look at that sometime because it'll show you who Babylon was and why God used all those scriptures to say what it is again in the future. Uh, for, uh, I'm on page 868 in, in volume 7. Yeah. You might find that interesting to see the scriptures. You might even put together a little Bible study for yourself. See, when you talk to people, you can show that God said Babylon back here and he's saying it again in modern times. Okay. All right. If there are no more questions, we'll have prayer and we'll close for this time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit of prophecy that we can see things are happening in our time just the way we were told. We're so thankful that you have called us. Each one of us here has heard your voice. We have responded according to the measure of our capacities. We're still moving with you. Put it in our heart to desire that perfection of character that you've promised. Help us to realize that when you say something, it's what you mean. You have never, never said something that you didn't mean to do. You have placed it in your word that you mean for us to see sin. You must have had a way of doing it in us. You would never tell us to do something we can't do. Help us to see that we need to invest time. We need to invest prayer. We need to study your word. We need to hear your voice. We need to have that connection. It needs to become the most vital thing we know. Help us, Lord, to sense that it takes more than just a casual look every now and then. Our whole life is involved. We thank you that you never blame us for anything. You know who we are, but we know too that if a desire comes in our life to have what you have for us, that if we grow cold, you're going to change events for us to get our attention. And if you have to get us the hard way, you're going to do that too. You're not going to let us go without a fight. We thank you. We pray for the blessings in Jesus. Help us, Lord, to know we're moving towards that time when you really are preparing a people to give the loud cry. We're coming into that time when the world must be warned. Help us to see. We've got to be a certain way with you or our knees are going to buckle at the wrong time. Help us, Lord. Help us sense that we're not here for ourselves, that we're here to help someone else along the way. We thank you that you've already made provision for us in Jesus' precious name.